Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. Praise God. Good to see everybody here this morning. Those out there watching and listening, I imagine we have a few more than usual today. Hallelujah. Can anybody say triggered? triggered. You know, it's a new word in the society and culture now that we have triggered. I have never seen more Christians triggered over what's in the Bible than today, in this time period. Absolutely freaking out. Um, I guess by now, y'all, most of y'all have heard that Pastor Greg Locke has challenged me to a debate on basically secular heliocentrism view of the universe versus the Bible's view of the universe. And uh, I've accepted that challenge and looking forward to figuring out, hearing back from him when we're going to be able to set that date up. I hadn't heard the date yet. Um, but what has happened, and if y'all got those, uh, those two pictures of the, the videos, we're going to put those up real quick. And we, believe me, we're going to get in the word this morning just for a minute. Okay. But we posted the video, and all I did was put together the clips of him Wednesday night and just to show he, he issued this debate challenge and what he said. And I've had 8.2K views in just a few days. I, don't, I guess it was when we put it up Wednesday night or early went Thursday morning, actually. Um, and then Chad Riley shared his before I did. And uh, you got that picture? And it's at 12.2K views there. Um, I don't even know. There's people that are sharing it beyond what I have. I've even seen people talking about this all over the place. Uh, Trey Smith shared a, just a post about it, and it has a 1,000 comments. Um, yeah, we're, the comments and the posts and the friend request that I have received over the last few days... I can't even keep up with it, all right? But I'll tell you what's happened. What's happened is, too, the, it, uh, I'm, I'm shocked, and I think probably Pastor Greg is shocked as well, is how many people actually are believers in biblical cosmology, flat, domed earth, non-rotating, immovable earth. I think it's, a, it's, it's actually, uh, a, I think, a new eye-opening event for a lot of people. Um, oh yeah, and there are people, the tons of comments of, I can't wait for this, I've, I've heard about this, but I'm really interested in knowing, hearing both sides of the issue. So, it's, it's going to be, this is going to be epic, y'all, this is going to, this is going to be a worldwide event. Um, <laughs> of course, as long as, as Pastor Greg doesn't back out. And, uh, but I don't think he will. He kind of laid down the gauntlet pretty strong. Um, now, at the end of the day, I don't care what happens. I told Pastor Greg, and I mean this. I said, no matter what happens, I love him. I bless him. I know God's using him and going to continue to use him. Um, and we'll still be friends no matter what happens. But um, it's going to be good. And it's necessary. See, I, I really believe it's necessary because there is a lot of, I mean, folks, I've had some crazies. I've had mega church pastors that if I named their names, you'd know who they were. Send me nasty, angry emails and over the, over the years. I mean, just furious because people in their church decided to believe the Bible and not the cotton candy gospel they had been getting for years, right? How dare we believe the Bible? How dare we believe that it's all important from Genesis to Revelation? I'll tell you one of the most shocking things that I've seen in comment after comment after comment. And believe you me, I've been through most all of these comments, hundreds of them, just reading them, responding to a lot of them, right? Um, uh, your mega church pastors don't tend to do that. They tend to, you know, stay in their ivory castle somewhere and they don't interact with the people, you know. But I try to get out there and answer questions and intervene and stuff and just talk, you know, but I, I've been blown away. I think the biggest issue that I've heard when it comes to talking about this, about just believing what Genesis says, 
believing what Job said about creation, believing what Jesus said about the stars falling and other things, just these things, I can't believe people say, it doesn't matter. This is what Christians, Christians telling me it doesn't matter. Then I will tell them, do you know how many atheists that I have seen come to Jesus in the last eight years since I've been preaching the truth about biblical cosmology and creation? And here's what's wild. There are Christians who look at me like, they, like, like a deer in the headlights, like they can't comprehend. And I'm like, do you understand? I could give you testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony of atheists. And I'll, I'll ask them, how many atheists you led to the Lord in the last eight years? Even your most anointed, gifted witness or apologetics individual say, maybe one, maybe two. I've lost count. Uh, let, let's put these up real quick. I wanna, I'm going to show these first because I'm going to show some of these at, at the debate as well. But this is, I mean, this is not like it's hidden. This is, these are, I took screenshots from my book. Chapter 6 of Like Clay Under the Seal. The title of that chapter, Atheist Come to Jesus. And one after one. But look at this, Thomas, I don't know how you say that, Schwan or Khan or whatever. Sean, a German brother, commented on the recommendation part of the Dean Odle Ministries Facebook page on August 9, 2019. He wrote, this ministry is filled with the Holy Spirit. Here you get the whole truth. This pastor led me with his teaching of biblical cosmology from atheism to our Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. People pray for this ministry, the pastor and the church. Do you see, do you hear that? I know pastors that have been preaching for 30 years that haven't led one atheist to Jesus. And they have the audacity to tell me that this truth from the Bible doesn't matter. Can you fathom that? Let's go. Thomas Robert Shaw here shared. I found Jesus and God through flat earth. It changed my life. Rannick testified all the preaching in the world could not pull me out of atheism. Once I realized the earth was not a spinning ball, it was about two seconds later when I realized the Bible is true and my lifelong atheism was toast. I understand the gospel is the most important thing, and it is, but if you want to turn an atheist around 180 degrees, flat earth does it faster than anything else. Atheists are always demanding proof of a creator. Flat earth is that proof. You know why it's proof? Because you can go out with a high zoom camera across flat body of water and you can prove it every single day if the conditions are clear. Howard Masakati says, after 1,000 hours of research of the flat earth, I found Christ and I believe the Bible. Let's go to the next one. We're just going to do a few this morning. Y'all okay with that? Since we're so crazy and we're just wasting our time, I'm going to waste my time on this right here until Jesus comes back. Because anything that will bring somebody to Jesus Christ, any truth in the Bible is important. You understand? Lord, have mercy. Yeah, go to the next one here. Let's see. Lillian Hubbard commented to me. And the, all these I have screenshots from my either social media or when I used to have a YouTube channel. But Lillian Hubbard commented and said, the flat earth brought me to the truth of Christ. Before I was into yoga, Hinduism, and aliens, the truth that the earth is flat brought me to the Bible and the issue of demons. I realized that I had been under demonic possession since birth. Jesus set me free. Somebody praise the Lord about that right there. <laughs> Patrick Dodd wrote to me. I was blown away when the truth of flat earth hit me. I am now a follower of Jesus Christ. Jenny Webb testified, I always knew the Bi that the Bible and mainstream science could not both be true. So, so for most of my life, I chose to trust in learned men about the origins of earth and the universe and everything else. The flat earth led me to God and his son, my savior. God's word literally true is literally true. And all men are liars. Come on now. I got enough. Let's do another. The next one. Y'all want to read a few more? Former agnostic Brian Nielsen wrote, Flat Earth solidified it for me that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 
Two years ago, Marky Marx commented on truth is stranger than fiction. Uh, YouTube, Will, Will's channel there. He said, I have been awakened for two years now. I was a believer in uh, until my late teens. I am 50 now. Flat Earth brought me back to God, whom I was questioning for years. I asked God to save me out loud. Looking up just last year, I'm so confident in, G Jesus, in Jesus, my Lord, and it is a wonderful feeling. Uh, Tiffany Contreras wrote on my YouTube channel, Jesus saved my life, but flat earth turned my life back to him. When I found out the earth might be flat, I decided to read the Bible for the first time at 45 years old. Finding out the Bible said the earth was flat showed me the Bible could be trusted. Reading the Bible put God's words in my heart and changed me in a way I never imagined. God became more tangible knowing he was right above me on his throne. I never could grasp where God was, and he seemed so far away in some distant galaxy. He said, now I get before him humbly on my face in prayer, and I know he can hear me. I sing loudly on my deck up in the mountains because I know he can hear me. I love Jesus. He saves. Amen. Now, somebody go ahead and praise the Lord right there. Now, I want to tell you, I could do this all morning long reading these. All morning. I'm just giving you a few. I've been getting some more recent than when I wrote my book. Now, why would any Christian get triggered over this, over, over this issue, over what true biblical cosmology? I'm going to tell you why. Because most Christians are ashamed of God's word. And this is too embarrassing for them. Because if they dare go down this road, they're going to be more persecuted, more ridiculed, more mocked, more laughed at, more looked at as fools. But see, I'm going to tell you something right now. What did Paul say? Paul said, he said, we apostles. What are we? We are fools for Christ. God has chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. Right? I know I wrote it in my word for my people to see. Believe and follow me. For I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Amen. We don't have that happen very often. But let's look at something. Let's look at some scriptures. And if you didn't hear that first part, it said, I am the Lord that created the earth, the heavens and the earth. And that's, you know, how many times, let me ask you this. How many times throughout scripture is God bragging on the fact that he made the heavens and the earth? He doesn't act like it doesn't matter. I, mean, I don't know but what's wrong with some of these Christians, but God sure talks about it a lot. Um, but I want to go to some New Testament scriptures first here. I, wanna, I want you to turn with me, and I want you to put up, uh, first let's just put up 2 Timothy 3.16 there. 2 Timothy 3.16. And now how many times do I have to repeat this verse? About every topic. Not just creation, but every topic. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Okay, time out. 
So that means there is not one thing in the Bible a Christian can say is not profitable. And if they do, it's a demon talking through them. Because this is what the holy inspired word of God says. All scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. For instruction in righteousness, with the next verse, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I literally last night had somebody tell me it does not matter at all. This is a born again, spirit filled Christian who just happens to also be a high school science teacher. All scripture. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, you want to trouble me? I don't care. I had somebody too. Um, in fact, the same individual a number of years ago tell me that I shouldn't talk about the Nephilim, the giants. Yet it's in the Bible all over the place, right? And I thought to myself, why does the Bible offend you? And his argument was, well, you know, if you talk about things like that, that just scares people away. But again, why, why should we talk about the giants? You know, Genesis 6, when the sons of God, angels, came into the daughters of men and they created the hybrid race of the giants, some of which were 36 feet tall. And we have this, them talking about these mutant giants throughout the Bible with six fingers and six toes and Lion-like men and, you know, Goliath was probably 11 and a half feet tall. We found, you know, the Smithsonian hides most of them, but their bones have been found for centuries. All right. But why is that an important truth? Because, listen, one of the things atheists throw at God, basically, or throw it at, against the Bible, against Christianity, is that God is a genocidal maniac that just decided to wipe out men, women, and children of certain people groups. And if you don't know that some of these people groups, in fact, all of them that he said to wipe out were half breeds, that they were part of these fallen angel, Nephilim giant combination. Once you know that, you realize he was dealing with stuff that wasn't fully human. So that the human race itself would not be destroyed. And that, again, makes sense. God had a reason why he wasn't some genocidal maniac as Richard Dawkins and these other atheists try to proclaim but see that one little simple truth destroys the an argument a stronghold in the mind of an atheist or agnostic person oh you have to have the context of the story before you make such accusations toward the scripture well the same thing with this we have, we have the modern scientific world trying to give us their view of the origin of mankind and the nature of creation. And I'm sorry, Christians have tried for years to mix that oil and water together, and they stir real hard, but they do not mix. We have a PhD in physics sitting here said that what opened her eyes, she realized that both cannot be true. The modern science version the Big Bang, the heliocentric model of the universe, and what the Bible teaches cannot go together. This is a PhD in physics, y'all, not this a, a, a crazy preacher from Alabama, as Alex Jones said. He's talking about that crazy preacher in Alabama talks about the firmament. Who could that be? How dare I talk about the firmament? And yet God said, it shows his handiwork and his glory. He spent all a day too making it. And yet, nobody knows what it is. Not one pastor. This same individual who's been a Christian for 30 something years that I was talking to last night. I started asking, I, I, I explained to him. I went through the scriptures explaining to him what the firmament was, what the ancient history said about it, what Josephus said about it, what the Jews all believed about it. Went through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation about it. 
And then ask him, so what is the firmament? He said, I don't know. I said, wait a minute. You know what the earth is. You know what the heavens are. You know what the, the sun, moon, and stars are. I said, you understand all that in Genesis 1, but the firmament, you don't have a clue. I said, but I just told you. I just explained it to you. And I'm telling you, it was like, boom, boom, boom. And isn't it interesting that somehow the firmament is nothing or we don't know? I mean, one pastor, I, I played this when I did the sermon series, The Firmament and Clueless Pastors. This guy was calling pastors, trying to, ask, you know, asking one, and rabbis and priests. He was calling all kinds. Of, What's the firmament? I've been reading Genesis 1. Can you tell me what the firmament is? One guy said it was the earth. And then the guy goes, well, the, fir the, the sun, moon and stars, it said, are in the firmament. So that would mean the sun, moon and stars are in the earth. And he goes, yeah, you know, that couldn't be right. Really? That was your answer. That's the best thing you could grab, Pastor. How is it that Christians have allowed the world system to indoctrinate them so strongly that when they see and hear somebody give them the word of God on the topic, they still can't see it? Good. It's amazing to me. And the more we talk, the more that individual got upset. And all I was doing was systematically going through the word of God. You want to hear another interesting part of our conversation? So I said, I asked him, I said, yeah, I said, you know, Revelation 6 says that in the end, right before the second coming of Jesus, all the stars in the heavens will fall to the earth. So here's what was his answer. Well, don't you think that that was just John trying to describe what he was seeing, that it was really just meteorites and asteroids and all this stuff coming down? And he was just saying it, he didn't have any other language and terminology. I said, this is what I said. I said, well, no, I believe the Bible said stars and I believe the Bible's true and it will be stars. And I said, but you have a problem with your John's vision explanation that John just didn't know what they were because Jesus said in Matthew 24 that the stars will fall from heaven. So did Jesus not know what he was talking about? Oh, you know, we got an interesting conversation we had there. He tried to tell me Jesus didn't talk about it. Yes, Jesus, the, 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 just the example of Jesus saying the stars will fall to the earth at his second coming is a complete different cosmology than it, what is being taught by modern science. And then let me ask some of you, some of you more educated folks. Have you ever been in a spaceship and gone out there to see one of these little twinkling stars? No, you have not. In fact, most of what you've even seen from NASA pictures are animation and artist renditions. So when they tell you a star that's twinkling out there somewhere is some massive sun that is much, um, you know, a thousand times bigger than the earth. How in the world do any of them know that? And why do we believe them? It's all fantasies and fairy tales. Satan has created his own gospel. His own, he's, he's created his own creation story. His own, he, he's got everything. It's not just the gospel. You know, the Bible says, that, that Satan would come and bring us another Jesus and another gospel and, and another spirit. But he's also got another message about creation. He's got another message about the origin of man that we came from monkeys. I, I asked this brother last night. He said, well, Jesus didn't talk about flat earth or biblical cosmology. I said, he didn't have to. Everyone he was talking to already believed it. There was no concept of a spherical spinning water ball. I said, but let me ask you something. You want to make that argument 
that Jesus didn't talk about. I said, well, Jesus didn't talk about macro evolution either. But as Christians now, we have to deal with that lie, don't we? Or do you ignore that too? Satan has a lie against every truth of God. And it's our job as Christians to stand up to every lie and tell the truth. It's the truth that sets you free. I mean, this argument that there are things that don't matter. There are people that say, well, okay, let's go back to the subject of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, there are people that would argue until the cows came home that the gifts of the Spirit weren't for today. And they take one little passage and out of context in 1 Corinthians 13 and try to say the, the, the tongues have ceased. The gifts are done away with. And they say when the canon of Scripture was finished. It doesn't say that in that chapter at all. Right? But they'll take that and they've built this whole thing. And then if you start pressing them and start proving to them that the Bible says the gifts are still with us for today, like... Acts chapter 2 says the, this, when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and the evidence of tongues, it said, he, Peter stood up and preached and said, this gift is for you and your children and to all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So you show them that and they'll go, well, it's just not important. We just need to stick to the gospel. That's a secondary issue. This is where they do. Either, oh, it's not for today, it's not true, or it was for them back then. And then when you prove it's not for just back then, all of a sudden it's a secondary issue. We need to only just preach the gospel. And I'm like, wait a minute. Jesus didn't just only preach the gospel. He told them to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. He said, you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. You will speak with new tongues. What, was Jesus just getting off base, getting off course there and, and not preaching the gospel and doing, dealing with a secondary issue and just wasting his time? Oh, my God. The most foolish stuff I've ever heard. Put that verse up again. 316. 2 Timothy 3.16. I want everybody to read it with me. On three. One, two, three. Three, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All is profitable. All is profitable. All is profitable. So don't let me hear you say, Christian, that it's not important or that anything in the Bible is not important. I better not hear you say it because I'm just going to rebuke you to your face. The demon is talking through you. Let's go to another verse here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4. I feel like preaching a little bit today. I mean, to me, I learned this concept long before I... I learned about these things. I had a lot of studying to do from the time I was 19. Of studying of scripture. But this principle I learned real quick. You know why? Because I started out reading the book of Matthew and I got to this right here. Matthew 4. Verse 4. Jesus talking. But he answered Satan. Satan was tempting him. He answered Satan and said... It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Somebody say it again with me. Every word, every word, every word. You don't get to say there are words of God not important. This I learned. That's why when I, when, I, when I read this as a young man, it, it, the, you know, the red part of my Bible here, it got drilled into my heart. It got set into my heart. God's word is important every single word he said. And then God says this, what is it? It's Psalm 138, you can put it up, verse 2, I think. But in there somewhere, when he said he has magnified his word above his name. Lord, and if you take the Lord's name in vain, you will not be found guiltless. 
And yet he says that his word is magnified above his name. See, I get real concerned when I hear anybody start diminishing the importance of the scriptures. Like this whole Mandela effect nonsense. Oh, there's quantum effects changing the Bible. No, it's not. I'm sorry you have bad memories and you've had bad translations of the Bible that's screwing up your head. God is not allowing his word to be changed by some quantum effect or the, or the devil. You're basically giving the devil more power than God because God said, I will preserve my word to all generations. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away. One thing we can know for sure is God has maintained every word that he gave his apostles and prophets to make this Bible right here. Even little Napoleon admitted that. He said, this book destroys all who oppose it. <laughs> yes, it will. Crush you like a little bug. Say, well, Pastor Dean, are you saying that we have to believe biblical cosmology, a.k.a. flat earth and the dome firmament and all that to go to heaven? No. No, you don't. Now, I'm not going to say what happens once you have knowledge of this and revelation of this and you deny it. That's going to be between you and God when you stand there. But, you know, it didn't take for me. Somebody didn't have to give me an apologetics argument for me to get saved because I had an encounter with God when I was 11 years old. And that's what my faith was based on. So I, I knew anything that came against that. I knew Jesus was real and the Bible was true at 11 years old. And anybody that came again, when I went to college, I remember people trying to tell me uh, he, that the Bible wasn't true and it was this and was that. And I was like, even though I was not walking with the Lord as I should, I was I'd backslidden as, as a young person. I knew that Jesus was real and I knew the Bible was true. And I would not, I would not listen to it. I was like, I don't care what you say. I know. But there are people out there that weren't like me. They didn't get saved like me. Some of them were raised atheists like Paul from Sweden that came all the way from Sweden to, for me to baptize him in 2017 or 2016. Somewhere back in that time period. And he said, he, you know, he was a mechanical engineer, raised atheist by two atheist parents. And he said when he saw this truth of the biblical flat earth cosmology, he knew the Bible was true and he gave his life to the Lord Jesus. And then he couldn't find a church. In, he said, I couldn't find a church in Sweden that believed the Bible. So I, he said, can I fly to Alabama? Will you baptize me? And I baptized all six foot seven of him in that tub down there. I still don't know how he fit to this day. It doesn't matter. It mattered to him. It mattered to these people I read to you a minute ago. And see, here's the thing. I think this is why people, you know, both sides get pretty fired up about this issue. But the reason our side gets fired up about it is because Number one, we know it's biblical. And number two, we have seen the fruit of it. And how, number one, being true to the word and something, and then seeing something that is bringing atheists to Jesus like crazy. That ought to be important to every Christian. There's no Christian that should say, this doesn't matter. You are under a spell if you think this doesn't matter. You hear me? Every word. Now, let me show you this. Let's go to, uh, I guess we'll go to the Mark 8. I mean, some of these Christians worship this idea of space infinite space and galaxies far far away they've seen too many star wars movies 
And let's go down to verse, uh, let's go down to verse 38 here. And, and really, to tell you the truth, to believe the modern science version, you have to accept, blindly accept, what government agencies tell you. Think about that right now. We have government agencies that, that they say they have space agencies, and they tell us how it all is and how it all was done 14 billion years ago and all this nonsense that they make up. And Christians believe that before they will believe what is written plainly in the Bible. And you're going to tell me that there's not something wrong going on here? What's that? I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, he said the Milgram experiment where the, the, you don't question authority. Yeah, that, it, it's worked a lot. I'll tell you what, it's worked for, for Americans, you know, because we've, we've missed understood Romans 13 and think you blindly follow and obey the government. Completely misunderstood that passage, but that's another sermon. Mark 8, 38, whosoever, somebody, whosoever, would that include? Who would that include? Everybody, right? That's right, everybody, all right? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall be the son of man be ashamed. And when he cometh in the glory of his father with the holy angels. I remember reading this as a young man and literally trembling. That we should never under any circumstances be ashamed of God's word enough that we would not speak it. And this goes out to some public, I mean, some, uh, some, I shouldn't say public, I mean, some of these Christians out here who believe the Bible about biblical cosmology, but are still hiding in the closet because they're scared. Since when as a Christian, are you not to be in a place where you're willing to take the heat for believing the Bible? I've taken heat for years because I preach from the Bible and destroy the doctrine of once saved, always saved, no matter how you live. I've taken heat over that. Then I discovered Christians can have demons in them and need those cast out. Woo, I've taken heat for that one. I've taken heat for believing that Jesus heals and does miracles. That I've taken heat for speaking in tongues. I've taken heat for all kinds of stuff. And boy, let me tell you, I have taken heat for actually just saying, you know what? I believe... The Bible account of creation and the origin of man and the nature of the universe, I believe that account over what the world says. Whoo! You would think that I went to every Christian and stole their Bibles from them and told them that they couldn't go to church. Triggered. And I know everybody can't wait to hear Pastor Greg Locke's one verse, he says, it just does. I can't wait for this. I cannot wait for it. But let me just say this, and I'm going to say this, and just to deal with this. It, you, anybody who understands the very basic concepts of biblical hermeneutics, and for those of you who don't know what hermeneutics means, are the laws of interpreting Scripture. And for instance, and, and these are well accepted across all seminaries and so on, there's, there's certain laws. And number one's context would be one. Letting the Bible interpret the Bible would be another. Uh, looking at the culture and history would be another. Looking at the grammar, looking at the actual definitions of the original uh, language, and on and on. Okay? I mean, they're, there's just, they're accepted. And so your basic, you know, basic biblical hermeneutics it's real easy to go, okay, we're going to look at this and we're going to interpret it according to what, just what it says. We're just going to take it for what it says. It's not hard. And I'm just blown away. I'm just blown away that that's like, that's just thrown aside when it comes to this. Just the basic, basic laws of hermeneutics. Just cast aside. 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really I'm all over the place here. Let's go. I want to go to another verse here real quick. Jump over with me. Jump over. Let's go. Matter of fact, let's just go to Genesis 1 real quick. You know that, uh, and I know I was, I was, <laughs> I'm getting back to his one verse thing. You don't ever build a doctrine on one verse. You understand? Not on one verse. Unless one verse is all you have on a topic. How many verses are there that pertain to the nature of creation, you think? Hundreds. Right? So the way you establish doctrine is not by one verse anyway. Listen, people that believe the, the false doctrine of once saved, always saved, they've got a verse or two that they depend on, right? And if you take those verses by themselves and you don't take all the others, then you get a false doctrine. It's that simple. I, oh, I'll give you an example. Okay, what, what is, what is the, the, the main verse that's used? How, hold on. We're going we're gonna go to go to John 6 real quick. We're going to jump over to John 6 just to give you an example, all right? People that believe you're once saved, always saved, no matter. This is the main verse that they quote all the time. He that cometh to me, Jesus, when Jesus said, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Now, if you take that verse by itself, I'll get there in a second. Huh? If you take that verse by itself, it sounds like their doctrine is true, Right? But this is one of the, the, the laws of biblical interpretation or hermeneutics. What do we have to do? Y'all going, is it not working? Um, I think it's verse 36. I don't, just check me on that. He that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. 37. 37. All right. So he says here, all the thought that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and he that cometh to me I will know wise cast out. Now, if you just take that just the way it is, and you don't compare any other Bible scriptures with it, or look at the original language, or look at the Greek verb tenses, you will come to the conclusion that you are eternally secure no matter what you do. And this is what, this is what was taught by Charles Stanley, the Southern Baptist, Big time. They will say, he, you know, Charles Stanley said, even if you become a flaming homosexual, if you become a full unbeliever, you're going to go to heaven when you die because of this. So they built. Now, now think about this. We're talking about enti entire denominations who believe that as a doctrine because of this verse. Well, the problem is. This verse right here is contradicted. If you just take it at face value all over the Bible. But what do we find out here? He says, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me, this verb cometh here, to me, I will in no wise cast out. So once you know that there's free, three primary Greek verb tenses, and one is the present tense Greek verb, and that is ongoing, continuous action taking place in the present, once you know that's what he is saying here, and actually the King James is saying that correctly, he didn't say he that came to me, he that cometh to me, present tense, ongoing, continuous action taking place in the present, then it does not contradict scriptures like, put up John 8 real quick. John 8, 30 and through 31 there. It doesn't contradict this. So my point is, one verse does not create a doctrine. I'll show you this. And this he is Jesus, and he spake these words. As he spake these words, many believed on him. The word believed is saving faith, pistis, or pistuo. <coughs> <coughs> then said Jesus to the Jews which believed on him, if, somebody say if. Yes. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. So you see where we put the Greek verb tense, which would be grammar of the actual language. 
together with other scriptures that seem to contradict that it's conditional. Your security in Jesus is conditional with you continuing in the word, continuing to walk with him, continuing to be a disciple. Then you get the whole truth. But this is how false doctrines are created. One verse or one or two, and we ignore dozens that go along with that topic that need to be analyzed together and not excluded. You understand? Somebody say amen or oh me. So one verse. Oh, Lord, have mercy. One verse. Can't wait to hear it. I cannot wait to hear it and deal with it. Now let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis 1 real quick. Um, now, here, here's one of the things that, that is said, and actually, you guys put up, I know I keep telling you, we're going to come back to Genesis. Go, go to John, <laughs> go to John 16 real quick. We're going to go to John 16 and go down to, let's see here. What did I say, John 16? All right. All right, we go down, let's go down to verse 13. Now, you know, Jesus said that there was many things that he had to say to them at that time, but he couldn't, he couldn't say it. He said, you, you can't bear them now. Remember he said that over in, I think it's John 15, when he said, you can't bear them out. But when the spirit of truth has come, somebody say spirit of truth. Spirit now let me ask something, Christian. How do you think the spirit of truth is going to act if you constantly believe and teach a lie? He said, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into, somebody say, all truth. Wait a minute. You mean that stuff is not important? No, like he's only going to lead you into the, just the, the, pure, the basic gospel message. Jesus died on the cross for your sins, rose from the dead the third day. And you must believe that, repent, and that's all we preach. Good, good. See y'all later. Really, from what these people say that we should come in on Sunday mornings, I should just give you the basic gospel message and we should go home. But wait a minute now, if we're already born again, we're already saved. And the Bible talks about that we were supposed to feed the lambs and feed the sheep and cause the sheep and the lambs and the Christians to grow up and mature. Well, then that means we have to deal with other topics other than just the basic gospel message. I get this all the time from people. And I guarantee you that I preach the basic gospel message more than 99.9% .9 of most preachers in America this day, to this day. But this right here, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Let's keep going. He shall glorify me, Jesus said. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Now, he said he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. So if the Holy Spirit's going to come, lead us into all truth. He's going to take what it, Jesus said. He's going to take what's mine and show it to you. Go to John, John chapter 1. Let's find out something about Jesus. What would be something that belongs to Jesus? Creation. Because he's the creator. Isn't it funny? The Bible starts with creation. The Gospel of John starts with creation. The book of Romans starts out. And by the, before the chapter's over, 
is talking about creation. Colossians is talking about creation. We could just go down the list. But remember, it's not important. Isn't that what they tell us? Not important. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Stop. The Word, Jesus, made everything. And he's pretty proud of it. And he's the one that said the moon gives off her light, not gives off the sun's light. And I can tell you right now, a dusty gray rock doesn't reflect light. Her light, the moon, Jesus said, the moon, when he, before he comes here, the moon will not give off her light. And then, of course, in Genesis 1, it said he made two great lights, right? Now, if God said he made a light, is it a light or a reflector? Now, to me, this stuff is basic. But who told you it was a reflector of the sun's light? Who told you that? The world system. And you just took it in. But Jesus didn't teach that. You know, one night, too, I took my laser temperature thing. Who, who was it? Amanda went out there with me. Jordan's sister. It was on Wednesday night prayer. We just went, I see, It was kind of cold outside. Probably about 40 degrees here. Now, that's cold in Alabama. And <laughs> we went outside, and I had my laser temperature thing about, you know, because you can check the moonlight. The moonlight's actually colder than in the shadow like if the moon is cast in a shadow if you do directly in the moonlight it's colder than in the shadows warmer which is the opposite with sunlight but i remember taking it and the moon was full and it was it was up here and i pointed that laser temperature gauge straight at the moon and shot it negative 40 something degrees i then i took and just angled off a little bit to the right and shot and it was negative 15 degrees Now, I wonder what that's about. That's the moon's light. It's different. It's different than the, it's much colder. It's a unique kind of light. Almost like a, you know, how we have infrared, we have black light. It's just a different kind of light. And, uh, but again, this is the cosmology that Jesus taught. And notice he said, I'm going to lead you into all truth. So listen, Christian. The Holy Spirit wants to lead you into all truth of Scripture about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, about deliverance, about spiritual warfare, about walking in faith, about divine healing, and about the true nature of His creation. You don't get to say it's not important. Now, I'm going to show you. Let's go to this one. It's only 12 o'clock, so the introduction's over. But let's go to 2 Samuel. We might get to Genesis 1. We might not. <laughs> oh, I want to show you something. Because people say, oh, well, these things don't matter. So 2 Samuel chapter 6. Y'all don't mind if we read a little bit, do you? All right, let's read this. And again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went all the people that were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah and Uzzah and Ohio, not uh, Ohio, but Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, and drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Benadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on, uh, on all manner of instruments uh, made of fir wood, even of harps and psalteries and timbrels and on coronets and, uh, and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. Somebody say, smote him for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, 
And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah unto this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come unto me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David. But David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth to him because, the ark, because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And it was so, when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen of ephod. Now, I'm going to stop there. That's enough of this. But... This morning, and even at times, I'd wake up through the night, and this just kept coming to me. And here's a principle, and I want to tell you something. This is a, it's a scary principle. But this is the principle of the Lord. The things that we say, we would think that don't matter. God's not that way. And when it comes to his word, he's very serious about it. Very serious about it. So David, King David, who the Bible says the man after God's own heart, the anointing of God is on him. The spirit of God is upon him. And in the days of Saul, King Saul, when King Saul was disobeying the Lord and and the, the Holy Spirit left him and an evil spirit was troubling him. And all those years it said the ark of the Lord was abandoned. It was out in the woods. It said it was growing up with it. It was it was just discarded like a piece of trash. And to Israel, that was their most Holy represented the holy presence, the manifest presence of Almighty God with them. And it wasn't the object that was anything, but what it represented. God had them make that to where he would literally, his glory and his presence would come sit there. And the high priest, the only one that could go in there and offer the blood of the sacrifice to atone for the entire nation. So it was a holy thing. It was a special thing to God. And David had the right intentions. He wanted to bring back true worship. He wanted to bring back the presence of God to Israel. He wanted to bring back the glory and the blessings. But the problem was, with all of his right intentions, he ignored this little detail of Scripture that the Ark of the Covenant was only to be carried by the priest. Minor detail. But David thought, you know what, maybe he didn't know the word. Maybe he, didn't. maybe he thought it wasn't important. So he said, you know what, we're going to bring that to the ark. And you know what, it's all right. It's a long way for the priest to have to carry that thing. Let's, let's put it on a nice new cart. God will be happy with that nice new cart we put it on. It'll be all shiny. Well, you know. And here's what's wild is God allowed that to happen for a little while. He allowed that cart to truck on a little bit. See, I will tell you something. God will allow you to stay in error for a little while. He might allow you, give you, you might be in sin, and he'll give you space or time to repent. You, you get a season of grace. Remember what Paul preached, though, at one point. He said, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now he commands every man everywhere to repent. That's in the book of Acts. See, we got to the threshing floor. What was the threshing floor represent? The threshing floor represented where you separate the wheat and the, from the chaff. It's a deciding place. And right now, I want to tell you that, that the body of Christ is being sifted. We're, being, we're, we're in the threshing floor right now on many topics. Whether we're going to accept and affirm homosexuality like Andy Stanley. All kinds of stuff. We're we're, we're finding out God is is making people choose. Are you the wheat? Are you the chaff? And what happens to the chaff? It's burn up. They got to the threshing floor where the decision had to be made. And it said the oxen stumbled. And Uzzah... You know, the best thing that should have happened right there is they should let the ark hit the ground. But he thought, oh, I can't let the holy ark hit the ground. Well, guess what? It wasn't supposed to be touching that cart. 
But he puts his hand, thinking he's doing the right thing. And he puts his hand on it to steady it, and God smites him dead. And what message do you think God was trying to get across to them? You don't do things your own way. You don't ignore what my word says and think you're going to get away with it forever. I had this individual last night say, I don't believe when I stand before God, I'm going to give an account for not, uh, not, not speaking this, teaching this, whatever, this flat earth. Of course, he wants to kind of mock. And I said, oh, yes, you will. Oh, yes, you will. See, what he didn't realize is, is that it's been presented to him thoroughly now. Therefore, he's accountable. It's one thing to be ignorant. Maybe David was ignorant. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe somebody's whispered to the king, hey, hey, King David, you know, uh, the Bible says we're supposed to get the priest to carry this thing. Ah, it's all right. We got, a big, we got the big festivities rolling here. We got this brand new cart. It's never, oxen have never touched it. I mean, it's, got, it's never been in the field. It's never plowed through any manure. It's going to be great, man. It's going to be huge. <laughs> but they didn't know it was going to end up in death. And it was going to end up in being sidetracked. And everything that David had planned that he wanted to do to glorify God was delayed. And you say, Pastor Dean, do you think people go to, go to hell over not believing biblical cosmology? No. I do believe somebody might be in trouble if they begin to attack. Hear it and attack it. Okay, I'm just going to tell you that. Why do I say that? Because God's serious about his word. But I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying somebody's going to go to hell, but I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this, and then I'm, I'm through. This is what I have learned through all this. And I've learned this through the years. My old pastor in Rockwall, Texas, Dr. Larry Lee, when I remember him saying this often, and it stuck with me. It's, it's, and it's true. He said that the Lord spoke to him one time and said, Son, you move with the cloud. Or you die in the desert. And here's what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit, that cloud, that pillar of fire by night, and that cloud, that pillar of the day, when they had it in the wilderness, they had by day. When, he, when that cloud picked up off the tabernacle and moved, they were to pack up everything, their tents, their belongings, strap them on the donkeys and head wherever that, that cloud was moving. Now, they could have decided, you know what, I'm tired of moving around. I'm just going to stay right here. They would have kept living for a while. But they would have been out of God's will. And I want to tell you what I've learned over the years is when the Holy Spirit moves upon something or he moves in a direction or he's emphasizing a certain truth. You should be going with him. Remember in Revelation, it says here. What the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. Not just what he said. What is he saying now? What is the message now? What is the word now? And see, in 2015, the Holy Spirit moved powerfully. And it's not that there wasn't people believing true biblical cosmology, flat earth, the dome firmament. It wasn't that they weren't believing it. Before, there were, I found out there were hidden groups on Facebook going as far back as 2008. And there's always been Christians that believe it. In fact, you know that flat earth was taught in America in the schools up until 1950. Do you know that it was taught in Russian schools up until the communist atheist revolution of 1917? That there were Christians writing books about this in the late 1800s, early 1900s. This is not some new revelation. And the devil saw this building behind the scenes. And so he began to prepare his, you know, I, I did the whole series the, behind the circus. He began to prepare people that would be leading people astray, you know, like, okay, Eric Dubé. He got a lot, he woke up a lot of people to this, but where did he go with it? 
off doing yoga and wearing women's clothes and stuff in Thailand. I mean, this is not our example here. You get what I'm saying? And since then, though, when God, the Holy Spirit, see, the Holy Spirit, this is what happened to me. Let me tell you this real quick. 2015, I've been preaching on the Nephilim. I've been preaching on the alien deception. I've been preaching on all kinds of different topics in the Bible, warning people, a lot about Bible prophecy. And the Lord spoke to me. The Holy Spirit spoke to me in, in early 2015. Well, I said, no, probably about mid-2015. And he said, he said, I have something else to show you, and it's big. I knew this was the Holy Spirit. And I'm thinking, well, man, I talk about MK Ultra. I talk about, I mean, I talk about stuff that nobody else is, I, you know, very few like, other than like Steve Quayle and people like that talking about it. I was like, or maybe the Hagmans and all that stuff. And I remember thinking, what could it be? What, what could there possibly be that's bigger than these things? I mean, I was sitting there going, what else is there, Lord? What could it be? And it was a few months later that my friend who lived out in Hollywood that I'd been kind of mentoring and discipling sent me this video. And before it ever even said the words, before it ever even got to that part, I'm telling you, and I'm not lying. The Holy Spirit came over me. The presence of God came over me so strong. And I, and I said before it ever got to the part about flat earth and then going through the scriptures about biblical cosmology, I knew immediately. It just, the Holy Spirit downloaded it to me. Now, I spent the next, as, as I saw it, my eyes were open. I pulled out the Bible. I pulled out all my Hebrew and Greek lexicons. I started redigging into all these scriptures about creation the sun, moon, and the stars. Every, I mean, just digging into everything. And I'm sitting there going, it's true. I can't believe this is true. So at the time, you know, we had people following us from all over the world because I'm one of the few preachers that preach on Bible prophecy. So we had a lot of people that tuned in to Prophecy Quake, our podcast, and uh, tuned into church services because most pa pastors today aren't talking about Bible prophecy and current events and what's going on. So I had a lot of people that were giving to our ministry, following our ministry because of that. And I said to the Lord, I said, you know, after a month, and I could hardly sleep for a month because I was just, I would sleep a few hours and get up and just like, just researching, just digging, going through the Bible again. And once I've realized not only is this true, Biblically true that we live on a flat, not, you know, Greg Locke talked about riding his bicycle. This is about, I'm like, and so what, what he did there, I'm going to tell you what that is. That's, that's a, an argument where you misrepresent a person's position and then mock the position that you've created, which is a fallacy, a logical fallacy. And he did that. I don't know if he did it on purpose or he understood it, but that, and everybody laughs. Nobody that believes in flat earth, biblical cosmology, thinks that the earth doesn't have contours and mountains. I mean, if that's what you think, then you're a psycho. You know, that we don't believe that, and, and we can look, there's a hill over there, and there's a mountain over there. It's not about it not having contours. We know the earth has contours, but it's not a spherical ball of 24,901 miles in circumference. It's not. We can prove it. We can prove it with a camera, a high-zoom camera, and any body of water, and sometimes even over land, you can prove it. Uh, Kansas, in fact, the University of Kansas did research on the state of Kansas, which is about over 400 miles across, and said that it's flatter than a pancake. That's their words, flatter than a pancake. Do you know how much curvature is supposed to be over 400 miles? It's insane. I've heard it's about 22 miles high bulge is supposed to be there. But the university said, we studied the entire, all the way across Kansas, and said it's flatter than a pancake. Not just flat as a pancake, flatter than a pancake. <laughs> and then you find out that Kansas, everybody thinks Kansas is so flat. It's the eighth flattest state in the nation. Florida is number one. Wow. So Florida's flatter than all of them. Why? Because most of Florida is what? Very close to sea level. Oh, you mean, don't y'all mean sea curve? No, sea level. Flat, flatter than a pancake, scientific study, University of Kansas. 
But I digress. Where was I? <laughs> no, I have, I have, I'm having that 55 moment. No, nah, I lost my track there. I don't know. But <laughs> G- Genesis 1. But no, oh, well, I was talking about the flat, <laughs> the flat plain. We don't think it's, it's without contour, okay? Um, but here, here's the thing, 71%. 71% of the earth is water. Somebody give it, well, here we go. All right, let's see if we, can, if, we, if we can demonstrate this. All right, everybody see my water? Let me go to the camera over here. All right, see the water? You got me? Let's zoom in on the camera here. I mean, on the bottle of water. Zoom in here. All right, right. See it? Okay, and watch what happens. The water is level, right? Let's see what happens when I turn it. This. I'm not going to pour it on you, I promise. <laughs> now, did the, what did the water just do? It stayed level. No matter if I turn it this way, I turn it this way. It goes to level. Water goes to level. Come here, my physics professor. Come here a second. <laughs> PhD in physics, Chitra. I just want you. To, I just want to say. Hold on a second. Let's do this. Is that real water? I want you to hold it. All right. All right. Now, is that level? Okay. Turn it for me. Is that level? Turn it more. Is that level? Turn it down more. Is, is that level right there? Okay, so you would say that water undisturbed finds it. Now, would you say that, you know, I, of course, we have a different view of gravity. We believe it's buoyancy and density and not necessarily some mystical force called gravity. But just for the sake of argument, would you say that the gravity of the is not making this water curve at the moment? Exactly. Yet it can make an entire ocean curve, right? Okay, but this water, it doesn't make it curve because it's, this water is magical and it can escape the curve. Okay, all right. <laughs> so according to the PhD in physics, water finds its level and that even if you want to accept the theory of gravity, that somehow this water is not curving, it's resisting the force of gravity. But the ocean bends to it. Okay, no. This right here is actually, if you want proof, this is your proof. I know that the, 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 the people that want to cling to this lie will say, oh, there's all this, you know. You know, when they talk about adhesion, some, you know, sometimes water will, will run out of a glass and it'll cling to it and then it'll go down. That's just simply adhesion and there's surface tension and stuff like that. But... When you have a, a big body of water and it's undisturbed, it stays flat no matter what. 71% of this world we live in is water. We've shot high zoom cameras over Mobile Bay many, many times. And guess what we found? It's not, it, it, there's no curve there whatsoever. I asked the high school science teacher who is, has a master's degree, who's been through special training. I said, do you know the formula rate or the basic formula of the curvature of the earth? He said, I do not. Huh? Yeah, our, our physics professor says that's not in the curriculum. It's not taught. It's not taught to any teacher professor, anybody, nobody. I don't, care. I don't care what you're doing in the science world. You're not taught this. And it's a simple formula. At the equator is eight inches per mile squared. And I know I don't want to complicate things, but as you go up the ball, if it's a sphere, if you go up the ball east to west, it actually gets more severe, the curve. Uh, in Mobile, that latitude, it's actually nine and a quarter inches per mile squared. But we always just revert back to the eight inches, even if we're in Mobile, because that way we don't exaggerate anything. But in Mobile, 
I'm zooming in at 11 miles away across Mobile Bay, and I can see the spool sitting on the dock in the docks of Mobile. And I have this footage. I've shared it before. You can actually, we stood on the beach, even in bad conditions the last time we went, because the fog had rolled in the night before and didn't roll out. But standing in Fairhope, Alabama, on the beach in North Beach Park there in Fairhope, you can see the I-10 bridge 10 miles away. Well, at 10 miles, nobody thinks... How far should the earth be curving? How, how much of a bulge should there be? Blocking my view, how high is this bulge should be? At 10 miles. Okay? You could ask, you could ask right now, she could ask her physics students, and none of them would know. Right? And it's simple. 8 inches per mile squared, 10 miles, comes out to 66.6 feet. 66 feet is basically a seven-story building. Right? That high. Because buildings are about 10, 10 feet per story, give or take a little bit. All right? We can not only see the bridge, I-10 bridge, that is only 16 feet off the water in Mobile, but we can see under it. We can see the cars going across on top of it. According to the math of their ball, there's no way you should even be able to see this. And we've done it on multiple occasions in multiple conditions. It's not refraction. It's not superior mirage. By the way, of superior mirage, distortion is always turns the image upside down, and there's always distortion. So it's not a superior mirage. The refraction rates, there's no way the refraction rates are doing that much of refraction over a seven-story building and coming back down. No. No, 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 no. So see, I, the reason I'm bringing this up is because this type of proof that you can go out, I'll take anybody, anybody can go with me to Mobile Bay in the wintertime when the, the, the surface temperature is cooler than the air temperature, and you can see it for yourself. This is why atheists are convinced that it's flat and that the Bible is true because you can prove it. See, all these people, they laugh, they laugh and mock and think, oh, you're flat earth and you're so stupid. <laughs> and they, have, they don't even know the math of the curvature of the circle they, they think they live on, the ball they live on. So who's smarter? If I know the, fur, the, the curvature formula for your ball that you believe in and you don't, who's the dummy? But do you think that atheists are going to be convinced to turn to Jesus by another fairy tale when they already think the Bible's a fairy tale? No, they had to have solid proof. Let me tell you who we've had at these tests. I've had geometry teachers, two physics PhDs, engineers, AutoCAD experts that design ships for the Navy. A retired lieutenant colonel who taught at West Point, fluent in Russian, and also an expert at radar because his job was to defend Europe from Russian MiG attacks. And he said our radar system, called the Ice War radar system, could sit on the ground. It's eight feet tall. He said, I can see a Russian MiG 50 miles away flying 50 feet off the ground. He said, that's when I knew it's flat. He sent me a document. The lieutenant colonel sent me a document from the Russians, that's a FOIA document that the CIA had stolen from the Russians. And he sent me the document that's in Russian with, with him translating it. And it's a document from the Russian Air Force in World War II that states in writing that all of their bombing missions of the Russian Air Force during the war were all based on a non-rotating flat earth. And that's why when, when the lieutenant colonel, whom I had not met at that point, decided he heard that we were going to go down to Mobile Bay to do a test, he, he contacted me and said, can, we, can, can I go with you? Can I meet you there? So you want to talk about smart people. Like I said, engineers. The first test we had engineer that was a 40-year engineer graduate from LSU. Not dumb people, folks. Not dumb people. I have been contacted and interviewed Navy missile instructors. I have interviewed and talked to a captain that worked under General Schwarzkopf. 
I have talked to a PhD in Hebrew and Greek and asked, is anything, he's a PhD, Dr. John Strazich, a friend of mine, he is a PhD in Hebrew and Greek from Fuller Theological Seminary in California. I said, am I wrong about any of the Hebrew definitions? Anything that I'm going through the scripture? Nope. He even said, not only are you correct in all that you're presenting about this, he said, you're my hero. He said, because you were bold enough to put it out publicly when almost no one would. In fact, at the time, there was no other pastor in America that was willing to talk about this publicly, seriously, and go through the Bible on it. So, folks, don't be ashamed of God's word. Genesis 1 is clear. You know, let me get my physics PhD back up here. Come here, Chitra. <laughs> We're giving a preview of the debate. Um, my question to you is in physics and geometry, what is the definition of something that is, has a face? What is the definition of face in geometry and physics? It's not a globe or a circle. It's not a globe or a circle. What is it? It's a plane. It's a plane. Or a flat surface. Flat surface. Yeah. Flat surface. Yeah. Plane or a flat surface. Right. So the, the, the term in geometry for flat surface or plane, and you just heard it not from Pastor Dean, but from a physics PhD, is a flat surface or a plane, right? Genesis 1, what does it say? God, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. It talks about the face of the earth and the face of the deep. Why do you think it talks about that? He could just say the earth. He could just say the deep. He could say the oceans. He says, no, he says the face because he's using a geometry term to show you the shape. And it means flat surface. They'll say, the Bible doesn't say flat earth. Oh, yes, it does. Because let me tell you what he set upon the waters. He set the dry land upon them. Let, look, let's get one thing. Let me just blow y'all's mind real quick. How many of you know the Bible does not call the oceans part of the earth? <gasps> he said when he made, let the dry land appear that's the earth the earth is the dry land i've got an interesting idea about water i think the bible talks about waters above the heavens and then there's waters below in the great depth i think water is a very though it's a physical thing it's a very spiritual thing as well but that's another day but upon the face Find me a face of the earth verse. I can't remember the face. Flat surface. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But they tell me it doesn't say it. Doesn't teach it. Well, here, here in Genesis, there it is. I mean, and there's other places I'm going to deal with at the, at the debate. But, you know, last night what was interesting, that discussion was about the uh, mainly, I explained, I spent about 10 minutes explaining the firmament and just going through the scriptures. But I asked him, what are these waters that are above the heavens? I said, your view, the heliocentric Big Bang universe doesn't account for the waters above the heavens. I said, you say it's an empty vacuum. There's no water up there. But the Bible says there's water up there and it says it's forever. I kind of I kind of started out blowing away the canopy theory, right? And and I, we even I even pulled up my phone and we read Genesis one. What are these waters above the heavens? Where is heaven, by the way? I don't know. I don't know. Now this is somebody who's been a Christian for over thirty years but has been brainwashed 
by their education in the modern scientific theory and will look at the Bible and go, I don't know what that says, even though it's plainly written there. Now, what is that? Is it spiritual blindness? Is it demonic blindness? Is it being ashamed of his word? What is it? Did y'all get me one? Just throw up a few real quick. The face of the earth. Yep, there it is. For they covered the face of the whole earth. Somebody say face of the whole earth. earth. Remember he could have said that. It, real easy to say, just they covered the whole earth, right? Literally by saying face, he's saying they covered the flat surface of the whole earth. So y'all want to say a flat earth isn't in the Bible? I could do this all day long. All day long. A geometry shape term used in physics and in geometry to describe something's shape. Somebody say, face of the whole earth. earth. There you go. There's another one. And all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world, which are upon the? So he's talking about the kingdoms of the whole world, and then uses the term the face of the whole earth. So you have a choice. I'm going to quit preaching today. I love it. Everybody, our people online like, no, keep going, please keep going. (laughs) God has told us the shape of the place we live. He told us that there is a crystalline, molten glass firmament over it in which the stars are attached. He's told us that the sun and the moon are within that. And that they move in a circuit over us. He has told us not only is the earth immovable forever, I heard Danny Faulkner the other day trying to say, well, that that doesn't necessarily, immovable doesn't necessarily mean immovable. (laughs) Zechariah 111, the earth is still and at rest. Michelson Morley experiment in the late 1800s, early 1900s, they repeated, what did they discover? The velocity of the earth through the ether, through the universe, is nil, zero. And so when they discovered, you know, they knew that there had to be ether because every, everything has to have a medium. Like, like air, if there's no air in here, then the sound of my voice cannot reach you because the, the sound waves have to have a medium to travel through. The same goes for in water. Water is a medium. Well, there had to be a medium for light to travel And that medium is the ether. And the ether was taught in physics for centuries. Tesla, an expert in the ether. So when the Michelson-Morley experiment happened and they proved that the earth was not moving, physicists at the time had a meltdown. They had a mental breakdown. Because they say this experiment shows that the earth is not moving. What in the world are we going to do? And to the rescue, the fuzzy-headed idiot, as Tesla called him, Tesla, Tesla was the genius. Tesla called Einstein a fuzzy-headed idiot. And Tesla said, the ether exists. We can actually pull energy out of the ether. And he said, you know, Einstein comes along and creates his entire theory of relativity Because they had to do away with the existence of the ether. So they had to come up with another explanation that the ether doesn't exist. That's why they came up with the earth wasn't moving. So they basically try to call the Michelson-Morley experiment a failure only because they say, well, now now we say because they found out the earth's not moving. Now we say that, yeah, uh, there's no ether. But actually, a lot of modern scientists now are coming back to the fact the truth that the ether does exist so if you come back to the truth that the ether does exist then that means the earth is still and at rest and not moving through some vacuum of space that's science too right there boom somebody say boom Boom. so if you want to believe you're on a flying 
spinning water ball that somehow the water doesn't fly off of it as it spins a thousand miles an hour? Enjoy that fantasy. Because God's word is true. And men are liars. Yeah. And I will stand upon this word of God above what any man says from here on out forever. I'm never moving away. Amen. Amen. And you say, well, Pastor Dean, you know, I just can't turn loose of that. What I learned in school. Okay. But now you've been told. So now you have to decide. Am I going to continue to mix the truth of God with a lie? You have to decide. I will not. Because I'll tell you what, I've seen the fruit of it. And I also, see, I also saw this. And this is something that I discovered. You know, I was talking about move with the cloud or die in the desert. I discovered that when I asked the Lord, should I preach this? Should I go public with this? And the Lord told me, have I ever told you to hold back any truth in my word? I said, no, you haven't. He said, then you know what to do. I want to tell you, as I moved with the cloud, the anointing and the glory of God is upon it. And that's why I saw, as I began to preach this, the testimonies, atheists, I gave my life to Jesus. Another atheist, I gave my life to Jesus. Another atheist, okay. Do you think that I regret any of this? You know, Say it's not a salvation issue. It might not be for you, but it is going to be for somebody else. So you should care. Amen. Let's stand. I love the word of God. All of it from Genesis to Revelation. I say it's all important. It's all true. Every word is true. You know that folks, Christians like me, that believe the Bible from Genesis to the maps, Believe every word is true and God inspired and God breathed. You know, we're becoming a rare breed now. Very rare breed. And you got to decide if you're going to be the kind of Christian that says the word of God is true and all men are liars. Or I'm going to try to mix in their lies and justify them. And so I get along. So, uh, you know, and, and this is and this is another thing. It's a, it's a really big test. So, oh, well, people will walk away. People have been walking away from truth in the Bible as long as it's been around. The truth offends people. Jesus even told them, are you offended at me? Are you offended? Well, guess what? Blessed are you if you're not offended at me. Jesus, John, the verse John 6, verse 66. Don't you find that interesting? It's 666 verse there says, says, from that time forth, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They, they had said pre earlier, a few verses up, said, this is a hard saying. Who can bear it? And it says some of Jesus' disciples, meaning people that had dedicated their lives to, to follow him, when he said what he said in, in John 6 there, they said, that's it, we're done. So if Jesus loses people and has lost people and they've walked away because of truth he spoke and preached, do you think we're not? Do you think it? But are we supposed to cater to people and hide truth so that they'll stay in our church? Oh, well, that's the, that's the mentality of most of you mega church and, and church. We're going to water it down so we don't offend anybody. And to tell you the truth, this triggering that happens when you start talking about this to Christians, when they get triggered about this biblical cosmology thing, is because their whole life is about, especially these pastors, is about building a big church. And so you're automatically talking about something that might cause somebody to leave. Oh, God, we can't talk about that. I don't care how much Bible it is. That's why they start shutting people down. That's why the big mega church pastor out of South Carolina attacked me years ago and said, oh, because he, he might lose a few. Money. Money. And big churches are idols if that's the goal instead of preaching God's truth that may offend. We never know who it may offend. See, I don't care who the word of God offends. Don't care. 
I offended that person last night. Uh, they got up madder than a hornet that's been, you know, a hornet you ran over their home with a lawnmower. <laughs> Told them, I said, I still love you. But your version of creation is man's and mine's the Bible. Sorry. And you're a Christian. So it should be, yours should be the Bible too. I don't care how much you've been indoctrinated by that secular education system. But let's do that song again. Love her much.